Good morning, beloved ones. Turn to someone and tell them, I thank God for you. I thank God for you. Yes, I thank God for you. It's so nice to look out during the holiday seasons because I get to see people who I haven't seen. I see Leslie over there. We haven't seen Leslie for a while, longtime member who moved away to Hawaii and California, but she comes back during the holiday season. So thank you, thank you. She says always. So thank you, thank you for being here. I see my colleague Joanne and her husband. Thank you for being here. It's nice because this is a time where families start together and friends start to come together, right? We start to reach out for one another just so we can fellowship and be close to each other. I love the holiday season, but even though I can't believe that we're about to embark upon the holiday season for 2015, you know, because it feels as if it, it's truly come as a surprise to me. <laughs> Somebody said to me last week, you know, Thanksgiving is next week. I said, what? Right? It's so fast, so fast. And it just lets us know how precious time is because I'm just thinking we're at the beginning of the year or at least the middle, but we're heading towards the end of this year. So we're entering into the holiday seasons and I thought, well, you know what? It's so appropriate to begin the holiday season with Thanksgiving, right? In, in fact, it's always appropriate to engage in or begin or enter into any uh, activity or any event with a full measure of thanksgiving, right? Because when you can do that, it sort of sets the tone. When you can be thankful for your activity before you've even had the activity, you're setting a tone. You're sort of setting yourself up for success. You're setting the tone for openness for receptivity, because we're always open to receive our good, are we not? I, I, I think, especially at a time like this, during this season, we're, we become ready to receive our good. Is there anybody here who's not ready to receive their good? Especially uh, at Christmas time, because we know that we stand a good chance of receiving not only some goods, but some gifts. Right? So, so we're, we're ready for this gift-receiving time and this gift-receiving part of the holiday. But I began to think, what about the gift-giving part? You know, we're, we're focused maybe at Christmas on the gift-receiving, the gift, but what about the gift-giving part? Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes the gift-giving part wears me out. <laughs> and it, it, does, it wears me out because mainly I, I don't know what to get some people, right? Or, or you know, it's, it's sort of that phrase, uh, what do you give the person who has everything? So, and you, and you give, you, every year you have to find something to give them that hopefully is going to be, you know, enjoyable. Or what about the person who it's hard to, to satisfy? You know, you, whatever you give, it's never quite enough or not the right thing. Or what about having to give the gift to the person you really don't want to give a gift to, right? But you feel obligated to. There's a sense of obligation attached to your gift giving, right? You have to give maybe because they gave you something last year, so now you got to go find something to give them, right? I'm telling the truth. You know I'm telling the truth. <laughs> or what about the person who, whenever you give a gift, never seems grateful? There's a lack of, of gratitude. They don't know how to receive the gift that you're, that you're giving, you know? Or how about this one? If I give a gift to one staff person, I have to give one to all the staff people because you know that person's going to say, oh, you know, look what Reverend Sylvia gave me. And then they said, well, she didn't give me anything. <laughs> if I give a gift to one congregant, I have to give to all the congregants. Because you know, you all talk and like everything, you say, oh, I thought I was Reverend Sylvia's BFF. You know, <laughs> she gave you a gift, she didn't give me one. If I give a gift to one of my good friends, I have to give one to all of my good friends. 
If I give to one family member and we have a gathering, I got to give to all my family members. Right? And so it goes on and on. So I'm thinking, wow, this gift giving sometimes can be quite a challenge and it can be stressful. The shopping and, you know, all of that, it can be stressful if it is not given in the right spirit and in the right consciousness. Because it should be a joy. It should feel good, right? It should somehow be inwardly guided, and it should be a blessing to both the giver and the receiver. Should it not? Yes. So how do we give in the right consciousness so that it meets some of these qualifications of feeling good and giving and joy and, and being a blessing to others and to ourselves as well? One of the things that I love about this church and this ministry is that it is filled with some of the most kindest, generous, and loving souls. And I tell you that all the time. And we, you know, we also demonstrate that. And as a matter of fact, this season is our time and it's our season that we as a church have an opportunity to shine brightly. Because if you think about it, we have, uh, it's our opportunity to have what we call, I call our hands-on experience, where we can see and feel the efforts of our giving. We always tithe. We tithe every year, every, day, every month rather, throughout the year. But this is a time when we get to, as a congregation, you know, we go out and we have our, uh, our adopt a family, we have our feeding our seniors holiday for chairs, we have the new loaves and fish ministry, and so we get in there and we, we, we do hands-on. Some of you are cooking for the seniors and all of this, buying the bicycles, and I love it when I see, you know, the gifts that we give. So it's our time to, to demonstrate and to experience this joy of giving as a spiritual community, which I love that we do. But one of the things that I want us to understand spiritually that giving, you know, is a spiritual activity. And we should know that our generosity has a multiplying effect, right? And I wanted to see so that we could look at how does this work? How does this spiritual law of increase. How does one multiply one's blessings? How does that sort of come about? And so as I'm reading scripture, and I came across Paul's letter to uh, the churches in Greece. And Paul was encouraging them to offer their gifts to the church back in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is, was the home, sort of home base. And all the other churches, they, Paul would ask them to sort of help support the work that was being done at the church in Jerusalem. And he was encouraging them. And this is Paul's letter. And I'm reading from uh, 2 Corinthians verse 9, 9 through, 1 through 15, chapter 9. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And Paul says, I really don't need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem. For I know how eager you are to help. And I've been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. But I'm sending these brothers to be sure you really are ready, as I've been telling them, and that your money is all collected. I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you. We would be embarrassed, not to mention your own embarrassment, if some Macedonian believers came with me and found that you weren't ready after all I had told them. So I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready. But I want it to be a willing gift, not one given grudgingly. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. 
You must each decide in your own heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God. For your generosity to them and to all the believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Thank God for this gift, too wonderful for words. Now, I, I love this scripture. I, I was guided to it for our Thanksgiving message. And you're thinking, well, how is this uh, a Thanksgiving message? It seems to be a message on just giving. Well, not really. Because if we were to look at this, we would have an understanding of what Paul is trying to say to the Corinthians. First, he starts off with doing a little boasting. He said, look, I don't, he hasn't told everybody about the generosity of this church, right? He's boasting. Unlike I might do sometimes when I talk about my church to other people. I do brag on you a little bit, but I think I have a right to. I always tell this is the most wonderful church. I wouldn't want to serve anywhere else. So Paul is doing a little, a little boasting, right? And a little bragging. And his purpose, however, is to really show us how to multiply, it's showing us the nature of blessings, but also how to multiply the blessing of giving. Because he reminds us of the consciousness that is necessary in our giving. It's not just about giving so we could give. The first a few chapters he talks about, uh, he says here, in fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up the many Macedonian believers to begin giving. And then a little further, he says, um, but I want it to be a willing gift, not one given grudgingly. Okay, so he's giving us a hint that first, we've got to start off with a certain consciousness, right? Because sometimes we give because we feel obligated, because it's, you know, somebody told us it's the right thing to do, all that kind of stuff. But that's not the consciousness that we need to work with. First, he says, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin with. And so we've got to have then uh, enthusiasm. If we're going to learn how to multiply our blessings, one of the qualities and factors that are involved is enthusiasm. And to be enthused is to be what? Filled with God. That's what enthusiasm means. Filled with the spirit. Filled with God energies. Filled with God's presence and power. So we start there. We start recognizing I need to fill myself with the presence and power of God at work in my, in my, in my being. And then I've got to have a spirit of, uh, of, of willingness. I can't give, you know, grudgingly. There must be a spirit of willingness. Now, we're talking about how to multiply our blessings, right? So we start with enthusiasm, and we have to have a spirit of willingness. Then another thing that we have to have, or one might have, we have to have this spirit of generosity because he says, if you plant sparingly, you will what? Reap sparingly. If you plant 
generously, you will reap generously. So there has to be enthusiasm, a spirit of willingness, and of generosity, right? And then he says another quality of being you have to have in this consciousness to multiply your blessings is a consciousness of cheerfulness. He says, because God loves a person who gives how? Cheerfully. So we're, all, we're talking about these are the qualities of being that we're going to utilize to develop our consciousness and to be able to multiply our blessings, having a consciousness of enthusiasm, willingness, generosity, and cheerfulness. Okay? That's what Paul says. Now, after we acquire and develop this consciousness and this spirit uh, in our giving, what happens is we become more open for God to not only work through us, but also to bless us as we are a blessing. Because the good news is, you know, you can't give. The law is you cannot give without receiving. You don't give to receive, but you cannot give without receiving. So, so this consciousness of, of, of the spirit of giving helps to bless us as well. So we begin to be blessed, and those to whom we are giving are blessed. Now, verse 8, 10, and 11 says this. It says, God will generously provide all you need. That's what it said. God will generously. How? Generously. Didn't say that God was going to be a little stingy with you. Didn't say God was going to hold back something because you didn't do what you. God will generously provide all that you need. And then the scripture says, then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Now, what do we affirm every Sunday? I have what? Enough to share and to spare. See, so we got to understand now, we've got the consciousness. We're working on our consciousness and spirit of enthusiasm, willingness, generosity, and cheerfulness, right? So when we start to develop that, all of a sudden, God begins to do its work in us and will provide generously all that we need so that everything that you need, you will have, and it says, and plenty left over. Now, I don't know yet about you, but I'm glad to be, you know, I'll take God's leftovers anytime. Because it has to mean there's something good, right? Plenty left over to share with others. So our our giving and our blessings, the multiplication of our blessings is never just for ourselves. It is always also for the sacred, what? The sacred other. Then it goes on to say in, in verse 10, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. Now seeds carry what kind of quality? A multiplying effect, right? Within one little seed is a multitude of other seeds. And within those seeds, again, there's an infinite amount of blessings in one seed, of produce in one seed, right? And so, but who, who provides that seed? God. It says God is the one who provides the seed to the, pro, to the farmer. The, the, the infinite ability to have good is given by God, but he says he gives it to the farmer, and the farmer must do what? Plant it. That's our work. You got to plant it. Otherwise, the seed remains a seed, and we never unveil the infinite goodness and blessings of God. So he gives it to the farmer, and so it's, it's understanding the source. Who's the source? God is the source of all of our blessings. But we have some co-creative ability in multiplying those blessings with our consciousness and our attitude and our perceptions and with our actions of what planting a seed that we're so lovingly given. And then it says in the scripture, he says, in the same way he will provide and increase your resources. So we're talking about multiplying the blessings. God not only gives you the seed, but he's going to what? So he's going to increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. So what I like this, what it's saying, and then it says, and then you'll be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. You'll be enriched so that you can do what? Be generous. 
So what this is saying is it's telling us that when once we begin to develop a consciousness and a spirit of, of giving, uh, not only will we be blessed, but we're going to provide, we'll have an increase of our resources that are provided to us. In other words, the more we give, the more we will have to give, right? That's it. The more we give, the more we will have to give. And the resources, our, our resources just keep on increasing because a seed is, inf it, it, one little seed contains infinity, right? Because that seed contains more seeds and more seeds and more, it's a multiple, it, it's exponential. So this is so powerful for us. The more we plant that seed, the more we nurture it, the more we give, the more we receive, the greater we will be blessed. And our increase, our blessings just keep multiplying. Now there's a purpose to God's giving, uh, a, 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 a divine purpose, because not only does uh, God bless the giver and the receiver, but when we begin to act this, enact this spiritual law, the law of increase, the law of multiplication, the law of giving and receiving, when we begin to do that, what happens is it causes us to not only be blessed, but it causes us to remember God, right? and to remember God as the source and the author. Because this is what Paul says. He says, when we take your gift to those who need them, they will thank God. There it is. That's God's intention. They will thank God, and they will, meaning they will remember God. They will acknowledge God. It's like, have you ever been in a place where you, you just needed, you were in great need? You needed something very badly and deeply, but yet you had no idea how you were going to get it. You didn't know when it was going to come. You could not see your way through. We've all been there, right? You've had this great needs and you didn't know. And then it seems like out of the blue, a way was made. Out of the blue, something, either someone gave you something, but somehow your blessing showed up. And when that happened, all you could say was, thank you, God. You been there? Have you ever been there where you could just say, ooh, thank you, God? You know, now, in this church, we don't do a lot of shouting, and, 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 but have you broken out in a happy dance? You know, we get to, ooh, thank you, God. Because it came in the right time and the right way, and you could never have foreseen how it was going to show up. But God is an on-time God, and it comes just when you need it. Now, all you can do is say, whoo, thank you, God. Thank you, God. That's some powerful, wonderful stuff. We've been there. And so what happens is when we begin to, to, to enact this spirit, this consciousness, some great things happen for us. When we as a church adopt families for Christmas, or when we tie throughout the year to various places in need, or when you all individually give of your tithes and your substance to this ministry and to this church, it has a rippling effect. And it causes the blessings to multiply so that, you know, it could be one person, that the fact that we are here, somebody needs, somebody's bringing somebody that that day needed to hear something, that day needed to feel the fellowship of, of people. And we don't know who we're touching. We don't know who we're blessing. We don't know how many lives we are affecting, but trust me, we are affecting a great many lives just by our being. It, it is the truth. Paul said this, he says in verse 12, he said, so two good things will result from this ministry of giving. Uh, the needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God. For your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ, and they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. See, the fact that you have anything to give at all is grace. You understand? So it says uh, they will, they will uh, pray for you because of the deep 
overflowing grace God has given to you. And they will thank, and it says, he ends this scripture by saying, thank God for this gift, too wonderful for words. I love the way he says through this ministry of giving. He actually phrases it as a ministry of giving. See, sometimes we think it's just an act, but it's a ministry of giving because it ministers to the needs of others. And it is a way for God to be remembered, for God to receive the glory, and for thanksgiving to be expressed. For the giver to receive the gift that's too wonderful for words is this overflowing grace. Now, I want to live in the overflow of grace. Don't you want to live in I want to live in the overflow of grace. I want every activity, everything that I do to just reek with grace. Not just for me, but for everybody else who I come in contact with. It's the overflow. Tell them somebody, I want to live in the overflow. I want to live in the overflow. Yes. Because when you truly develop a consciousness, and we're talking about what? Consciousness. When you develop a consciousness of giving, that is giving with enthusiasm, willingness, generosity, and cheerfulness as a consciousness, what you are doing is you begin to open the floodgates of God's overflowing grace to enter into your life. When you, it, it's overflowing, that begins to enter into your life. Now, I want you to hear this. I'm not talking about, it's not, you know, this overflowing grace that will come into your life is not because you're a good person. It's not because you earned the right. Because grace is what? Unearned favor. It's un you can't do anything enough to get, but what happens is, it is because your consciousness is opened. And your consciousness has then your open consciousness, not because you're righteous and because you're good. It's good, it's nice to do good things, but don't think that's going to get you in heaven or anywhere else. Uh-uh. It's because you have become an open channel. You've become a channel through which God or the blessings of God can flow through. See, God is the source. And you are the what? Channel. He brings all of the goodness through various channels. Your job might be a channel. Your family might be a channel. We don't know where it's going to come from. But when you begin to shift your consciousness to one of uh, generosity, willingness, openness, cheerfulness, when you begin to have this consciousness of the spirit of giving to enact this law, all of a sudden that opens your consciousness, opens the floodgates and God's good flows through. You now become a channel. And as a result of that, a result of you being this channel, you'll not only be a blessing to others, but you will also be blessed in the process. You're a byproduct. Your blessings become byproducts. Okay? You don't have to even ask for your blessings. They'll start to come and to flow to you and through you without your even having to ask because your consciousness, excuse me, your consciousness draws it to you. You understand that? Your consciousness opens it up and it begins to happen automatically. You live in the overflow of grace. So this is very important for us to understand this consciousness. All of a sudden, you become the gift. Your actions, your energy, your words, all, your, your vibration becomes the gift that goes out to bless others and everything that you do then becomes a blessing. You don't even know that you're a blessing. Maybe you walked out and you smiled at somebody if they needed that. You're just the channel. God will begin to use you as he flows through you to do great things. Thanks giving becomes the gift that keeps on giving, right? Overflowing grace becomes the movement of your life and affairs. And this is the secret to multiplying your blessings. This is the secret of the ages, you know. This is the secret to multiplying your resources. And it is all done through you, through your consciousness and through your actions. Your act of giving, of allowing the goodness of God to flow through you. This is spiritual law in action. Spiritual law of increase in action. The law is give and you shall receive. It's just the way that it works. 
So as we begin to enter into this holiday season, this holy season, let's endeavor to do so with a new spirit, a new consciousness, right? Let us do so with being willing to give the gift of the spirit that lies within us. Let's give our enthusiasm. Let's give our willingness. Let's give our generosity. Let's give our cheerfulness. Because when we give that, then anything and everything else that we do will carry the Spirit of God with it, you see? And then God will continue to do the work that's necessary. And God will then cause everyone to shout, Thank you, God. Glory to God. Woo! Thank you, thank you, thank you, God. Thank you, God. So that's what I'm hoping you'll give this season. And we're going to start it off with our Wednesday Holy Communion Thanksgiving service. I hope to see you all there, and I hope to receive the gift of your consciousness, your presence, and your light. We have a great work to do, and it's wonderful. Blessings. Namaste. Blessings. Namaste and blessings. Okay.